your base review thing is only this is uh, questions taken from all throughout the course. Um, and about the final, the final exam is entirely made up of questions you've seen before. So they might be on homework, they might be in clicker questions, they might be on past exams. So there won't be any questions that you haven't seen before. It's kind of a compilation of questions that I've used in the course. So you can use that as a guide to your study. Now, there are a hundred questions, so it's well worth your while to actually understand the material and not just try to memorize the answers to all the questions. But in terms of framing your study, um, use the questions that you've seen in the course. And these will end up being posted as well um, later today. All right, so which of the following applies to cerebral palsy? Anybody not using a clicker today? All right, 11 is our magical number. All right, so cerebral palsy, non-progressive brain damage. Typically, when we think of cerebral palsy, we think of motor deficit as a result of brain damage. And that brain damage either occurs before birth or during the neonatal, the neonatal period, usually. Now, cerebral palsy, technically, can be... Uh, you can get it at any time if you've had brain damage for other reasons. Uh, but typically it's in the fetus or the neonate. So what's present at birth doesn't get any worse. And very typically the people will ask questions about uh, does cerebral palsy have any cognitive deficits? And the answer to that is not necessarily. Um, you can have cerebral palsy profound uh, motor dysfunction without any cognitive impairment. So we can't assume that. All right, and which of the following processes is phosphate ion not a major component from our uh, electrolytes chapter, electrolyte balance? And of those four, the one that's off is blood clotting. So phosphate is important in bone because it's the other mineral. It's the other non-organic uh, component of bone. So there's calcium and phosphate is what makes up the, the concrete, so to speak, of the bone. Metabolic processes involving ATP. The P is phosphate. So ADP, ATP, those all have phosphate ion as part of their metabolism. And then acid-base balance. The phosphate ion is one of the major buffer systems in the body. So there's the bicarbonate buffer, and there's the phosphate buffer, which is particularly important inside of cells. Um, and then there's the nitrate buffer. There's multiple buffers. Clotting is calcium. Um, when you think blood clotting, the ion important there is the calcium ion. No calcium, no blood clot. So people can't clot without it. All right, typical signs of a TIA from this last exam. What? T in TIA is transient, transient ischemic attack. So any neurologic dysfunction that's transient in nature, in other words, it comes and then it goes, that can be a TIA. Typically it involves muscle weakness in a hand or a leg. It can also include visual changes um, uh, or uh, hearing changes. It can uh, really involve anything. All right, select the statement related to tuberculosis from our pulmonary chapter. And that's going to be A, uh, because it's the acid fast bacillus that's always tuberculosis. It's actually resistant to many disinfectants, which is why it sometimes can linger in a building or in clothing and things like that. Um, and the other ones, it's not transmitted by blood. It's usually transmitted by aerosol. That's what makes it particularly nasty, 
is it's kind of easy to spread because it can travel through the air. Um, many people with a positive TB skin test don't have active infection, and it's only an active infection that you find the bacillus in the sputum. And it's only an active infection when the bacillus is in the sputum that you're contagious, um, because TB has a tendency to hide from the immune system in its little tubercles. Um, so it's not destroyed quickly by the immune response. It's one of those bugs that kind of tricks our immune system and our immune system doesn't handle it very well. So tuberculosis has is more complicated than your typical pneumonia because you have these multiple kinds of infection that can be present like we talked about. Which of the following values for an ABG would you see in advanced emphysema? Somebody's out of the room, right? So this is one of those questions you kind of have to take apart a little bit in your head and split it up. So in advanced emphysema, the patient has a problem with ventilation, much more so than oxygenation typically. In other words, they can't get rid of the CO2 they produce. So you're going to see an increased PCO2 because the lungs aren't getting rid of it. Now, it's not, a, or it's not an acute problem, though. In emphysema, it's a slow and steady progression of the disease. It gets worse and worse, but it does so very slowly. So you're going to see compensations. So while you see an increased PCO2, you're not going to see a dramatically increased pH. That 7.35 is just a hair more acidic than normal. And that's because of compensation. And the compensation that you see is an increase in bicarbonate ions. The more bicarbonate is present, the more uh, that increased pH from the high PCO2 can be buffered. So the kidney ends up secreting a lot of acid in the emphysema patient to get rid of some uh, acid, as well as creating a lot of bicarbonate to buffer the blood. So this would be a compensated respiratory acidosis is what that, uh, that description would be. Okay, CD4 positive helper T cells function by doing what? All right, so the CD4 cell gets its claim to fame as it's the one that's infected by the HIV virus. So of the multiple different kinds of immune cells, the CD4 cell tends to come up on examinations and stuff because of its connection with HIV. And the CD4 cell is the helper T cell. So it facilitates all the other things the immune system does. In other words, it's a helper. It doesn't fight infection directly. It helps other cells to fight infection like the CD8 cell, which is the cytotoxic, the cell killer, as well as the um, innate immunity, like the neutrophils and the macrophages. Identify the proper sequence in the healing process. I'll give you more time on this one because it's long. And this is going way back to our first unit. Good, once we got that. So the first thing that happens is a blood clot forms. That can happen real fast, so that kind of makes sense. And um, 
the next thing that happens is anything that's dead or broken or in there that shouldn't be in there has to be cleaned up or else there's nowhere to put the scar tissue. So the next thing that happens is the cleanup crew comes in. Then granulation tissue grows in. Granulation tissue is a kind of uh, specialized tissue that uh, fills in gaps and provides the foundation for healing. And then the body has this remarkable um, uh, ability to grow new blood vessels. So even in an area where uh, you know a lot of vessels have been damaged, vessels will grow into that area to return circulation for the scar. <coughs> Destruction of alveolar walls and septic is a typical change in what? <coughs> Short, simple pathophysiology question. That's emphysema. That's really what emphysema is, is the destruction of the, uh, the architecture of the lungs. So the, in emphysema, there gets to be fewer and fewer alveoli, and the alveoli are bigger and bigger because the walls between them have been broken down. Um, so you end up with problems with gas exchange, particularly CO2. Which of the following is trained to help individuals with swallowing problems? that's your speech language pathologist. So they not only work, you know, it kind of makes sense. If they work with the lips and the tongue and the mouth anyway, wouldn't it make sense that they work with swallowing? Because swallowing is one of the more complicated reflexes in the body, um, and it involves all kinds of different muscles, and it has to be coordinated just perfect, or you end up aspirating or having dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. All right, what is the cause of sickle cell anemia? Classic autosomal recessive trait. So you have to get a defective gene from both parents. And you might say, well, why isn't it D? Well, in sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin chains get made just fine, but they're, uh, they're, not, they're abnormal. So the, the disorder that causes a problem with synthesis of hemoglobin chains, those are the thalassemias. Alpha thalassemia, you have a problem making the alpha chain. Beta thalassemia, you have a problem making the beta chain. In sickle cell disease, they get made just fine, but they have this weird property that when they're hypoxic, they sickle into a strange shape. They stick together. All right, a broad spectrum bactericidal agent would be expected to what? The key word in this sentence is broad spectrum. What do we mean by that? A broad spectrum antibiotic kills both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Because that's one of the major classification points for bacteria. The first thing you ask is, is it gram-positive or gram-negative? And different antibiotics attack different bacteria. There's a, the one set of antibiotics for gram-negatives. There's another set for gram-positives. And then there are the broad spectrum that can kill both. Uh, the growth of most spores and acid-fast bacteria, not necessarily all antibiotics do that. So broad spectrum just covers bacteria, not viruses, not fungi, not tuberculosis. Renal disease frequently causes hypertension. Why? What?
our old friend renin. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. When the kidney sees a decrease in blood flow or a decrease in blood pressure, it secretes renin. Renin triggers angiotensin, which triggers aldosterone, and both angiotensin and aldosterone elevate blood pressure. So when the kidney gets congested and ischemic, it starts secreting large amounts of renin because it thinks, in not very great wisdom, that the problem is not the kidney, but it's a lack of blood flow. So we see a massive renin release, and uh, renal disease and hypertension almost always go together for that reason. And it's very hard hypertension to treat because the body's blood pressure controller is sick. So you end up with very high blood pressures. All right, which of the following terms refers to a combination of decreased circulating blood volume combined with excess fluid in some body cavity or space? And that's third spacing. And there's a term you will definitely hear in your clinical lives, whether it's in the ICU, um, taking care of uh, elderly, you'll hear this idea. And third spacing can be used to describe two things, really. One is fluid is in a body cavity. So normally, you know, fluid is in the vasculature and a small amount of fluid is in the interstitial space. Well, if you have a major hemorrhage or if you have a terrible uh, pleural effusion, you know, your pleural space is full of fluid, that's a bunch of fluid that's in the body but not circulating around. So that's an example of third spacing. You hear it more commonly, at least I did when I was in the hospital, talking about edema. That a patient who has widespread edema, they have a lot of fluid that's not in the vasculature. So they can end up with blood pressure problems despite having plenty of fluid on board. And that's third spacing too. In this case, the third space is the interstitial compartment, um, as opposed to, you know, there's the intracellular space, the intravascular space, and the interstitial space, and then here the third space would be interstitial in edema. All right, the structure of a virus includes which of those? probably touched on this in micro, too. That's a protein coat and either DNA or RNA. So viruses are very simple. They're almost more machine-like than they are cell-like. Um, the slime capsule and cilia, that's bacteria. Some bacteria have that as a way to escape the immune system or move around. Um, they don't have the metabolic enzymes for replication. That's one of the things that viruses don't have. They can't reproduce by themselves. They need the cellular machinery to do that and cell wall and membrane, that would be bacteria again. All right, Down syndrome is an example of which of those disorders? And it's an example of a chromosomal disorder that most of you got that. So it doesn't follow the same inheritance patterns as like an autosomal dominant or an autosomal recessive because it's not a problem with a single gene, it's a problem with a whole chromosome. In this case, they have three of chromosome 21. So uh, they have an extra 21. Choose the correct reason for severe hypoxia occurring with pulmonary edema. Okay, this is ARDS, or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And that syndrome occurs anytime there's edema in the lungs. You know, typically, in the normal case, 
the lungs uh, are made up of alveoli very, very close to pulmonary capillaries. Well, anytime there gets to be extra interstitial fluid, that's edema, uh, in the lungs, the space between air in the alveoli and blood in the pulmonary capillaries gets bigger and bigger. So there starts to be a barrier to diffusion. Oxygen can't diffuse into the pulmonary vasculature, so we get a major hypoxia problem. Uh, fluid in the pleural cavity would be a pleural effusion, um, and uh, the A and C are not, they're not really representing a particular illness. Benign tumors can often be differentiated from malignant tumors because benign tumors have one <laughs> properties. When we talked about neoplasms, we talked about the general characteristics of benign versus uh, malignant. And yes, benign tumors are usually encapsulated. They're, they're all in one place and they have a capsule um, and they grow slow. It's metastatic tumors or it's uh, malignant tumors that do A, B, uh, and D. Because typically benign tumors don't have systemic effects. And in reality, benign tumors can have uh, the increased mitosis and an atypical growth rate too, even though they're not um, uh, malignant. So that isn't a thing that's different about benign and malignant. Identify the common dose limiting factor for chemotherapy. So that's bone marrow depression. Chemotherapy, it doesn't differentiate. It treats all cells the same, whether they're cancer cells or whether they're normal cells. So anywhere in the body that we have cells that uh, rapidly divide, they're going to be attacked and hurt by chemotherapy because that's what chemotherapy targets is dividing cells. So weight loss and hair loss, that's alopecia, um, and nausea and vomiting, those all come from destroying or uh, injuring rapidly dividing cells, but all three of those things can be dealt with. It's the bone marrow depression that we can't do anything about, so that limits how much chemotherapy we can do and how often. We have to give the bone marrow a chance to recover before we hit it again with another chemotherapy round. What term is used to describe a deficit of all types of blood cells? A vocabulary question. All right, and that's pancytopenia. Um, a, B, and C are all the words that you'll use that you'll hear and use when taking care of cancer patients because very frequently they're pancytopenic. In other words, their platelets are low, their blood, red blood cells are low, and their white blood cells are low. They could be leukopenic, their white cells are low. They could be neutropenic, their neutrophil count is low. They could be thrombocytopenic, their platelets are low, or they could be anemic. Erythrocytosis is having too many red blood cells. All right, which of the following occurs frequently with acute pain but not with chronic pain? back to our paid chapter. That we zipped through pretty good, I think, if I remember right.
right, jump in there, number three. There we go. One of the big differences between acute pain and chronic pain is the stress response. In acute pain, you have a stress response, which helps to kind of prepare the body and helps the patient to deal with that pain um, in a kind of physiologic way. When pain goes on for a long time, then that stress response isn't there. So we see A, C, and D along with chronic pain, which can be very difficult to treat and hard to live with for the patients. All right, when do clinical signs of infection appear? So the patient doesn't experience symptoms of infection until that microbial colony is big enough to actually cause damage. So, you know, throughout our lives, we have periods where we have a little bacteria in our bloodstream or where we have a viral infection in some part of our body. And we don't notice those things, even though the immune system is activated in response to it. And even though we've got microbes uh, replicating and uh, uh, germs inside of our skin where they don't belong, we don't notice it because that colony never gets big enough to cause any damage, so we have no symptoms. But, you know, we're fighting off infection every day even though we don't notice it. Why does diabetes insipidus cause polyuria? So diabetes insipidus, usually just called DI. DI results when there's no antidiuretic hormone. So if there's no antidiuretic hormone, what's the patient going to do? They're going to diurese. They're going to have polyuria. Um, and there's two main kinds. One is ADH is not being secreted. The other is ADH is being secreted, but it can't do anything. And that's congenital DI. Which pathophysiologic process applies to acute PSGN? Postrepticopal glomerulonephritis. You should teach your toddlers that word. It will sound really good at dinner parties. Postrepticopal glomerulonephritis. My daughter had to endure some of those things. Hmm? Did you teach your children big words? My first daughter, I did. <laughs> no. When she was two and a half, she uh, knew her shapes up through octagon. <laughs> Including trapezoid, that was always the favorite of the friends. All right, so what is PSGN? This is where immune complexes get deposited in the, in the glomerular tissue. And then those complexes trigger an immune response, an inflammatory response. And basically, the immune system starts tearing apart the glomerular membrane. So what you get then is you get blood in the urine, and you get protein in the urine as that glomerular membrane breaks down. And it results from uh, a strep infection. The body creates antibodies, which is a good thing, but those antibodies end up cross-reacting, and you get acute PSGN. This is one of the main reasons we treat strep throat. The strep throat left alone will get better all by itself, but it can lead to some of these complications like PSGN. So we go ahead and treat it with antibiotics. All right, systemic lupus erythematosus is caused by what? When I was a medical student, I used to read my uh, medical textbooks to her because I had to study. I was a single dad, so she just got to learn along with me. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right, so SLE, when you think systemic lupus uh, erythematosus, think anti-nuclear antibodies, also called ANAs. That's how they're abbreviated in the chart. So um, these are antibodies to components normally found in the nucleus, particularly DNA. Which of the following is often the first sign of ototoxicity? Just add that one. And that's tinnitus or ringing in the ears. Important to note, however, that not all tinnitus is because of ototoxicity. This is a tinnitus that doesn't go away. So, you know, we all occasionally have ringing in our ears from time to time. That's probably not nerve cells dying. Um, it's probably just the ear being a little confused about what it's doing. All right. In uh, PSGN, the glomerular inflammation results from what? Myopia. And farsightedness is presbyopia. All right, so that's a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Good. And what that type 3 means, that just describes that antibody antigens get deposited, causing an immune response. That's what a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction is. Choose the basic cause of osteodystrophy associated with chronic renal failure. I wish this course was a whole year, because we could have talked a whole day about renal failure. Hmm? I don't know, I should ask. It would be better if it was, because we could go into a lot more depth on these things. All right, so that's failure of the kidney to activate vitamin D. Remember that vitamin D is important to calcium metabolism, putting calcium into bones, getting calcium into the blood. And uh, vitamin D has two spots where it has to be uh, activated. One is in the skin by UV light, and the other is in the kidney. So if either of those two things are deficient, we become vitamin D deficient, and then the calcium starts coming out of our bones. So we get an osteodystrophy. <clears throat> Which signs are typical of Graves' disease? And that should be an apostrophe, that first question mark. So you have the signs of hyperthyroidism, which includes heat intolerance, restlessness, and increased basal metabolic rate, weight loss, anxiety, agitation, fast heart rate, a lot of things that kind of look a little bit like a fight or flight response. In Graves' disease, the exophthalmos is kind of diagnostic because that's not present in other forms of hyperthyroidism. And that's where the eyes are bugging out of the head. All right, which of the following would be the most likely cause of an iatrogenic disease? Another vocabulary question. And iatrogenic means caused by the treatment or caused by medicine in general. Um, so uh, a side effect of a prescribed drug would be an iatrogenic problem because it, the only reason it happened is because of the treatment for something else. A lot of things being done about iatrogenic problems today because what we've learned is people have a tendency to get sicker in the hospital than they do at home. And, uh, that hospitals are dangerous in some ways, that you know, you're more likely to die if you go to the hospital than you are if you're not. So there's a lot of things being done about eliminating iatrogenic effects, you know, like good universal precautions, you know, having uh, uh, isolating people with, com uh, with particular pathogens. All right, what are the signs, the significant early signs of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm? What? Are these ones that we've already seen all of them? 
the I think there might be new ones in this set. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I'll just tell you the truth. Um, okay, so a ruptured cerebral aneurysm, you get meningeal signs because whenever there's blood where it doesn't belong in the CNS, you get meningeal signs. So that's nuchal rigidity and photophobia. Same thing you get with meningitis. Um, it's the severe headache that's the cardinal sign of uh, ruptured cerebral aneurysm. The typical description is worst headache of my life, you know, searing pain, and that's because you've got a artery that popped. Good, you all got that. What is the basic abnormality in thalassemia? Why do these questions all sound familiar? On this one? They may, this review set may have been pulled by, from questions we've already seen. But I think it's still a good review. Of all the things you could have learned in the course, Somebody's out, yeah. So the problem in thalassemia is either the alpha chains aren't made or the beta chains aren't made, like we talked about before. Uh, let's see. None of these are real things. All right, when comparing angina with MI, which statement is true? This one, I think, would come up on some of your board exams or could. Angina versus MI. like in the prioritization questions I've heard so much about. So are those priority questions, are they what do you do first or are they who do you treat first? Both. Both? Mostly what do you do first What do you do first, first or next? Or next? Mm -hmm. Those questions are on the, uh, those style of questions are on the boards for doctors. All right, so the big difference is angina gets better with rest and nitroglycerin, MI doesn't. Because in angina, the heart is simply uh, not getting enough oxygen. In MI, the heart muscle is dying. So once heart muscle starts to die, that pain isn't go, gonna go away. So which of these two patients, the one that the pain went away or the one that didn't, which of the, those, need your care first, the MI patient, because they need to go to the cath lab, they might need clot-busting drugs, something to stop that MI. All right, all are factors that promote healing, except what? And that's advanced age. The younger you are, the faster you heal. One of the reasons why pediatric hospitalizations are so much shorter than adult ones is this fact. The younger you are, the faster you get better. All right. What does seroconversion mean with respect to HIV and AIDS? <laughs> Dr. Mock talks about HIV in some other class, doesn't she? Have you ever heard of it? Micro. micro. It wasn't a Did you have uh, Dr. Mock for a micro? No, I had Dr. Oh, Nicole. I think Brenna's like an HIV like expert. Like she did some yeah. research in it. It was just anatomy and then physiology. Uh-huh. Uh, HIV. Yeah, she knows lots of that. But are we down a person or am I just... Somebody's clicker not working? All right, so seroconversion, what that word means is antibodies are now present. And we often use seroconversion 
um, as a, not so much a diagnostic, but a, a, a time. This, that's when we can identify antibodies in the blood. That means that there's been an exposure, or in the case of a vaccination, the vaccine took or the vaccine worked. Because like when you get your hepatitis B vaccine, you have some day that follows where you seroconvert, where antibodies begin to appear. So it means uh, that the antibodies are present in the blood. And um, you know, typically we test for HIV by testing for HIV antibodies. So because there's a delay between infection and seroconversion, that's that window period that we talked about, where a person can be infected with HIV, but their test comes back negative. All right, the stress response in involves the integrated action of which of those? Every time I see this question, I say, I don't like this question. Whenever there's a question where I'm not sure I would get it right, I don't like those. It has to be D. Yeah, it's good. It's all three of those things. We're not going to spend much time. All right, during an inflammatory response, erythema is caused by what? So one of the, the take-home messages from this class is I want you to understand inflammation because inflammation is like the cornerstone of pathology, of what goes wrong with the body. Um, so the four cardinal aspects of inflammation are redness, um, swelling, warmth, and pain. And you should be able to describe why each of those things happen. So the redness and warmth we get because of vasodilation. There's more blood flow in that area. The swelling we get because of increased capillary permeability. The capillaries get leaky, so fluid comes out into the interstitial space and we get swelling. And then the pain comes from the uh, immune modulators trigger a pain response, like the prostaglandins and prostacyclins. And this one too, the histamine irritates the uh, sensory nerve. So the erythema is caused by vasodilation. Why do vascular occlusions and infarcts happen with sickle cell disease? And that's what sickle cell disease does, is the erythrocytes change shape. So whenever there's an area of the body that's hypoxic, they become these sickle-looking things, like the sickle that you uh, cut meat down with. And so all those red blood cells end up being stuck together very easily. All right, most medications, drugs, are metabolized where and excreted where? Classic pharmacology. Glad I'll never have to take another farm class. Maybe, but not like that. <laughs> Long lists of things I'm not good with. All right, so metabolized in the liver, excreted through the kidneys. Very good. All we got. Which of the following microbes is an obligate intracellular parasite? And that's, oh, 
I was like, wait a minute, Nora. That's a virus, okay. An obligate intracellular, oh, it's the word parasite. People don't think of it. It's a bad word. This has come up before. Technically, a virus is a parasite. You know, a parasite is a creature that uses another creature's resources for its own ends. So a virus is a parasite. And of those four things, even if you ignored that last word, obligate intracellular means that it has to be inside a cell. And those other three things don't have to be inside a cell. There aren't any fungal or protozoa that live inside of cells. There are some bacteria that do, but they don't have to live there. They end up living there. So it's really a virus. But let's see what you picked. You, B and D. So a protozoa, a protozoa is a single cell uh, uh, advanced life form. So like, um, the, the trichomonas, for example, it's, it's a, a single cell organism that can live independently out there in the environment. Like plankton has a lot of protozoa as well. Not a good question. I know that last word is through everybody. All right, what are the characteristic changes in the brain with Alzheimer's disease? Again, that first question mark should be an apostrophe. My computer got confused once. I forgot what an apostrophe was. And because we have this increasingly aged population, Alzheimer disease has become much more prevalent in the populace, so it's important to know a little bit about it. And cortical atrophy, they get less wrinkly brains and they get less brain mass atrophy. And then you get plaques and these neurofibrillary tangles um, that impair conduction. With regard to meningitis, choose the correct combination of microbe and age group. So it's uh, children and youth. So strep pneumo, that would go with neonate, or the, I'm sorry, that would go with elderly. E. coli would go with neonate, and then uh, Neisseria meningitides, that's the common meningitis, meningiococcus. Multiple opportunistic infections develop with acute leukemia. Why? And that's B. So it looks, you know, uh, clinically, it looks like there's a decreased number of white cells, even though on the blood test on the CBC, you have this giant white count. And it's because most of those white cells aren't functional. They're immature, they're cancerous, so they're uh, dysfunctional. So we have a, a decreasing number of uh, mature and active white blood cells. An atheroma develops from one. And an atheroma is the primary pathological form of atherosclerosis. It's what causes that pathology. Good, you all got that. Benign tumors in the brain are often life-threatening. Why? Yes, just remind me to have you guys look for atherosclerosis in your cat. Uh. 
So anything inside the skull can cause increased intracranial pressure, and increased intracranial pressure can be life-threatening. So whether benign or malignant in the brain, it doesn't always matter. The fact that it can't be removed, that plays in too. So in some ways, that answer is correct as well. Um, because oftentimes they can't be removed without damaging brain tissue. Okay, therapeutic measures for osteoporosis include what? Again, a very common disorder as our population gets older and older. What? Why your mom does? All right, so supplements of calcium and vitamin D. The other thing I like to remind you about with osteoporosis is the fact that bone is alive, so it's changing all the time. And the reality is bone only becomes strong when forces are applied to it. So if we have a person who doesn't do much weight-bearing exercise, their bones are going to have a tendency to weaken because the body only puts calcium in bones that are used, and bones that are used are bones that are exposed to forces. So the more sedentary the person, the higher the risk for osteoporosis. Which of the following statements regarding Down syndrome is true? Talk about that list of characteristics of Down syndrome. And that's the typical characteristics are present at birth. I strongly recommend when you do your OB rotation for pediatrics, if you get a chance to see a newborn or infant baby with Down syndrome, go look. Because that's really where we need the best eyes on the child, because you want to pick it up early. You want to pick it up before the child goes home with mom and dad. Um, so learn that look of the Down syndrome. Um, the other things, Down syndrome is really very variable. There's a wide spectrum of heart and medical problems that go with it. Cognitive impairment, you can never assess at birth. You really only know uh, how well that child's going to develop when they start developing, when they start missing milestones. And then while the risk of Down syndrome goes up with maternal age, there are babies born to you know 20-year-olds that have Down syndrome. So it's not that there's no risk, there's just less of a risk. Persistent thick mucus in the bronchioles of the child with CF may cause what? So people describe the mucus of CF like glue. It's like glue. So you can imagine if you've got glue lining the air pipes, you might end up with air trapped on the other side of the glue. You might end up with atelectasis. Air can't get past the glue into that area of the lungs. Repeated infections, because now you've walled off a section of lung where there's fluid and air for bacteria to grow. And the irreversible damage can occur because of the repeated infections. So CF, you end, they end up with cysts in their lungs, or these areas that have decayed uh, from infection. Which of the following causes acute renal failure? And of that list, a, a bilateral acute glomerulonephritis can cause acute renal failure. Those other three um, can, can cause chronic renal failure. All right, we'll go to 50 and stop. What are the typical changes occurring with Crohn's disease?
So what I ask you to pay particular attention to is to be able to discriminate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease, because for whatever reason, that comparison comes up a lot. Um, so in Crohn's disease, you have skip areas. It affects the region of the intestine, and then it's, the next region is fine, and then the region after that is affected again. So you have these skip areas. A is what you would see in ulcerative colitis. There aren't any skip areas. It kind of starts at the rectum and ascends and goes up through the colon. Uh, degeneration and flattening of the villi, um, that's, uh, oh, I just lost it. What is that? Celiac disease, thank you, gluten uh, sensitivity. All right, last one for today. The pathophysiology of peptic ulcer disease may involve any of the following except for what? And that's going to be B, because truthfully, increased mucus production would actually protect you against um, peptic ulcer disease, because the two main causes for that are a decrease in that protective mucus in the stomach or an increase in the acidity of the stomach. All right, we'll call it a day right there. On Wednesday, yes, Wednesday, we're going to meet in the computer lab, Walsh 217, for our final.